<laughs> little bit what controversial feel? today. We're getting into some controversy with breast implant illness with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Robert Whitfield. He is the top dog when it comes to breast explant surgery. But here's, let me give you a little backstory as to why we are almost 300 episodes in and why I have not talked about breast implant illness yet. Because, and I'm sure Dr. Rob will agree with me, every person that I hear speak on this subject has one answer. Take your boobs out. And I don't feel like I need to or want to because I like the ones that I have and I don't have sure. problems. So that's why I was always resistant to bring someone on because I don't want the message to be, if you have breast implants, ladies, get them out. If you have Hashimoto's and you have implants, get them out now, drop that 2025 20, G and get them out when I don't think everybody does. So then Dr. Rob and I are talking at a conference and it turns out he doesn't think that either. So I'm like, all right, then now it's time to chat about this topic because I am going to talk to Dr. Rob about a couple people, patients, friends of mine that I know that did not have a positive outcome from their bre breast explant surgery. So Dr. Rob, thank you so much for coming on. I can't wait for this conversation. <laughs> well, we, we had a few chats about this. And so um, from a background perspective, everybody needs to know like how I got to where I am. So I'm a plastic surgeon, but my my structure is based in oncologic reconstruction for breast cancer, head and neck cancer, and sarcoma. So I've always taken care of uh, women with breast cancer. And that being said, I took care of them closely as you would for any patient, but a patient with cancer is screened heavily all the time and followed up carefully all the time. So I would see my patients so frequently, and I, I had no idea what breast implant illness was when it was first posed to me, because um, I had never seen it in my practice. Um, I think the rigidity with which you know we followed both our surgical technique and care for our patients afterwards would limit the ability for that to happen. And then in cosmetic patients, I didn't have a separate system to take care of them. I cared for them the same way I took care of my cancer patients with extreme, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, a lot of follow-up so that I always would know what was going on, you know, and I didn't see this in my cosmetic practice either. And fast forward to 2016, I had a breast cancer patient who relocated from the Georgia uh, state of Georgia to uh, Austin to retire. And, and from time to time, I would be asked by breast cancer patients to just remove their reconstruction, not because of a specific problem, but because they were tired of having it. There's lots of emotional issues around that. So mine was not to talk someone in or out of that decision. That's a, the decision someone, you know, arrives at. And I, I, you know, listen to this uh, patient very carefully and her one complaint was fatigue and um, having cared for a lot of cancer patients of different uh, varieties uh, many times you'll hear that complaint from them either from problems with bone marrow suppression after chemotherapy or just fatigue from uh, having to deal with cancer for such a long period of time just both emotional yeah. yeah so of course and you know um, my mother passed away from cancer. My sister had breast cancer. And so I, you know, I try to take care of everybody like their family. So I, basically I took care of this gal and took the operating room and, you know, requested, um, she actually had a request for me. She said, can you do an in block capsulectomy? And I was like, why would you even know that term? I mean, that's a pathology term. And, uh, you know, I had done cancer care my entire career and had been trained, you know, by great surgeons. And I was like, well, yeah, I can do that. I mean, just a weird request. And I had no idea where it was coming from. Right. So I, I took her, and I, I did the case and she had to be monitored overnight in a hospital for a cardiac condition. I saw her in follow-up and she was doing really well. We reviewed her labs and I always checked every case for residual uh, or recurrence in a cancer because you have to, it's, it's a cancer case. Right. 
And I always, when I took out a set of devices and capsule and all the materials uh, involved, all the scarring and everything, I would always check for um, any residual bacterial or fungal contamination. And this lady had an E. coli infection. Whoa. So that's so, not just in the gut. That can be anywhere in the body for those listening, right? Yeah. For your listeners, that's a bad problem. That's and a problem. On a CLIA-based lab system, so that everybody listening understands, there's two ways to do things. There's swabs that look like Q-tips that then you swab a space or a substance or a liquid or a fluid, whatever. And then you'll send that to the lab and they'll plate that. They'll put it on an auger plate and try to incubate it. That's the tradition. That hasn't changed in 100 years. Then there's PCR testing. And we'll talk about that later. So this was on a CLIA-based hospital system test. Mm -hmm. And you know exactly how bad that has to be to get that result. So your audience listening, that has to be greater than 10 to the 6. That's over 100,000 colonies of bacteria. And I was like, how did I miss this? Right. How? I, I mean, I went back through all my notes and I'm, her pictures. And I'm like, I was like, how on earth did I miss this? And, you know, magically all of her fatigue went away. Wow. So, uh huh. She had okay. a breast implant infection. And so it was still kind of beyond me, like how uh, this had occurred. I couldn't, you know, find this. I was just like, none of her labs were wrong. You know, nothing was off. Just, just the fatigue thing. Okay. And so clearly, you know, this, this woman was very sweet and she put me on some board on Facebook, I believe, and said I did explants and I would do an in-block capsulectomy. And just people started coming out of the woodwork to see me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because I had missed that, I was very, you know, leery of missing things. I, I had always prided myself on never missing a cancer case. So um, this really bothered me. I was a cancer patient. And I would be beside myself if someone had done that to my sister and, and missed something. So right. I was like, well, if these folks have tons of fatigue and, and otherwise, you know, an exam is, is normal, you know, I have this now case that didn't make sense to me. Okay. And so from time to time, people opt to have, you know, devices, you know, removed, but at that point, I was still placing devices for cancer reconstruction and for cosmetics. By devices, uh, you mean implants, right? Yeah, I was still, yeah. I was still, you know, just performing a you know, my normal practice that I had done for years. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I'd have people come in, and and so that everybody understands, like from cancer training, I learned all these different basically methodologies and had more tools in the toolbox than most people about correcting problems. So I was a go-to person for implant-based capture contracture, malposition, um, you know, just revisions, like things that people didn't really as a, you know, community-based plastic surgeon who just did cosmetics would even have necessarily that much experience because in cancer cases, those problems exist all the time. Because those folks have so many different problems with surgeries being more aggressive and extensive due to cancer. So I learned all these things. So I was always a resource in any community I've ever been in to take care of problems. And so, you know, I would see and take care of people. And then from time to time, I'd have somebody ask me for a, an explant. And it may have been somebody who had multiple revisions. Now, I will tell you, if you've had multiple procedures, you're set up for problems. Um, I mean, hold on to that. Don't, don't, we're going to, that's a little tease. We're going to come back to that for sure. Right. Okay. Right. Keep going. Yep. So not everybody, you know, needs or wants to have an explant. I'd have people come in and ask me, you know, very frequently, uh, especially at that time frame, like, what do you think about this? Should I get this done? And all I had was that really limited experience. And I would say, you know, in, in, in this small sample I have, you know, I've had people have a couple problems with infections, but otherwise I don't have, you know, a big experience to, you know, tell you 
and give you perspective about it. You know, part of giving someone a informed consent in a surgery is knowing all those things. And now fast forward six years later, I can definitely right. tell you a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so. I was going to say, so somebody comes to you with that, but that's what I respect about you is that, that you're not saying literally every person that had an implant put in, which you obviously do for aesthetic purposes too. So you're not anti-implants. <laughs> you are basically saying it depends on the person. And that's that's why you're here talking because that is what I believe as well. I think it's individualized. So now you get that same question six years later. Now, how are you going to answer it? Yeah. And now, you know, I will, I will say now in the last couple of years, I stopped my revision practice. And basically because eventually everybody will have a problem and it doesn't matter how good I, I am at fixing their problems. So at this point, I don't do revisions or primaries anymore, but it's not because of a, a so much a device issue. It's, it's more of eventually, whether it's a hip, knee or breast implant, they're going to need to be replaced or revised or something's going to happen. Sure, and sure. at this point in my career, after 20 some years of doing that, I just don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> so yeah, like that's totally fine. Yeah. If you yeah. want to focus on the X plan. So let's let's really go into first of all, what makes someone a candidate for X plant surgery? Let me back up. That's a big broad question. Let's let's go through what are the symptoms of having a, a breast implant illness truly and right. kind of the steps that women should take because here's the issue that I see and I, I kind of hinted to it in the beginning I see women in all these Facebook groups like you were kind of thrust into like here's what Robert does but all these Facebook groups and and listen I'm coming from the hypothyroid world I see patients every day coming to me with the fatigue and the hair loss right. and the weight gain and all the things. And they're in the Facebook groups. God, just tell me an answer. Give me something. Give me, give me a direction as to why I feel like shit. Right. And they grab onto an answer. So I'm willing to bet that at least 10% of the people in the breast explant illness groups, Facebook groups are searching for that answer. Maybe <laughs> it's the implants that will finally make me feel better. Right. So not everybody needs it. Let's go through who does and what you look for. Right. So, you know, we talked, I'm giving a, a talk at A4M this Sunday. And the headline of my talk is, you know, really, what do I think breast implant illness is? Right. And there is no medical diagnostic code for breast implant illness. So both you and I deal a lot with inflammation. You know, we experience and deal with in inflammation individually in our lives and personally with our patients and really breast implant illness to me is just inflammation. The medical device, the breast implant itself is only one potential driver of inflammation. So you, as well as I know that your immune system and how it functions dictates much of how we manage, deal with, and get rid of inflammation. And if your gut health sucks, if you didn't pick your parents right, if you don't take care of yourself, if you got exposed to mold, heavy metals, um, phthalates, glyphosates, all this stuff, then yeah, you're going to have breast implant illness. Mm -hmm. And there ain't damn thing I can do about it other than take out those implants and get the rest of you sorted. Because as good a practitioner as you are, uh, as good as I am, as good as our colleagues are, once you've reached a certain amount of inflammation, you can you can take care of those clients as well as possible and still not really solve that problem because now it's not just that you know the gut's out of whack or thyroid's off or you know their sex hormones are off or they eat like crap but now they have a device that also contributes to a huge amount of inflammation especially the texture devices those are extremely strong promoters of inflammation in in what i've seen over 20 years is that just because of the texture on them itself and it irritates the the tissue around it? Yeah, it's the increased contact because of the surface area and in particular the devices that have been pulled um, from Allergan 
I mean, their intent in those devices, because I was a oncologic reconstructive surgeon most of my career, those were really designed to help us take care of cancer patients because okay. cancer patients don't have a lot of tissue left, right? Because the the whole risk reduction is really to do a mastectomy and leave, you know, very little tissue. And right. so you need something that gives a woman the most shape form possible at one time. And it was never my um, uh, practice to use a lot of implants. I was a specialized type of oncologic reconstructive surgeon. I used your own tissue to make a breast. I would use the tummy tissue. I could use the thigh tissue. And I did that using microsurgical techniques. So that's really, I mean, that was my forte. Mm -hmm. I really didn't do a bunch of implants. I would honestly end up taking care of people who had implant problems and convert them to what's called an autologous reconstruction. So, you know, my experience is a little bit different. Um, and I think now people want to use both programmatically what I've developed, my heart program for recovery. Um, they kind of try to get advice from me on what to do, just like you're asking, like, well, what should I do about this? And, you know, now I have this have and will always have this huge interest in functional genomics. It's always been the most interesting thing to me. And it's where medicine should be, not where it is now. Mm -hmm. And when you look at their immune system pathways, their vitamin D metabolism, their methylation pathways, their antioxidant pathways, and how they manage and deal with glutathione metabolism, you can see who is a setup for this problem. Mm -hmm. And so when but people ask me- It's not necessarily autoimmune, right? It's not no, just, yeah. No, no, okay. No. I just want no. to clarify. Yeah. It is not an autoimmune disorder. No. Autoimmune means it's you're attacking your own body. Mm-hmm. Th this is not, this is, you know, how you manage inflammation. It's, it's, you know, everybody comes to me because they want to look and feel better. Right. I'm the guy who actually does something about aging. Right. So if we manage inflammation better, you're always going to look better. You're going to feel better. You're going to age better. So, you know, now that we know more about functional genomics and instead of using a prescription, we can use a supplement, we can alter a diet, we can change a lifestyle issue. Like those are the most meaningful things for these patients, whether or not I do an explant for them. I try to get them all to understand and embrace the concept of managing their inflammation. Right. Right. That's beautiful. So, and I think that's part of the, the, the thought process has gone wrong around this is that people think, oh, it must be an autoimmune situation because I have Hashimoto's I'm going to have breast implant illness. And you're literally saying, no, it's not even about that. It's literally about the inflammation in your body. So yeah. now how do you, and this is the other thing that I have mad respect for you for is that you actually take people through a, a functional program and right. you look at sex hormones, you look at thyroid, you look at markers of inflammation, insulin, all the things to, to see if there's something that we can do before we go into surgery, right? Well, the most powerful thing is like who teaches you. And I happen to be taught by great, great, you know, just surgeons and just people. And every Saturday morning, I would just get beat on on rounds about nutrition. It's because the people who trained me were the people that came up with the concept of IV nutrition. Their mentors had taught that uh, they didn't come up with it. Their mentors basically had. It was that genre of surgeon and that's what kept little babies alive. That's what kept critically ill patients alive. And back, you know, when I trained, I'm, you know, basically old enough now. <laughs> That's kind of funny. But uh, we didn't have intensivists in the hospital. If you were a surgeon, you took care of your own patient from point A to point B, mm -hmm. to point C, until they went home, till discharge. Imagine that. There, there, there wow. was no, no person you called. And- my mentors would shame the death out of you if you did think you needed to call somebody because you weren't smart enough to figure it out. And so they made sure you were a very good doctor. The whole point was before you were a good surgeon, you had to be a very good doctor. And so when someone asked me, why do I even care about nutrition? I'm like, well, my burn patients and my cancer patients probably cared that I knew a little bit about nutrition. <laughs> So grateful. that's how they stayed yeah. alive. They're grateful that so you know about the, the plastic surgeons where I trained, we ran the 
burn care for the entire state of Indiana. We were the tertiary referral center and the plastic surgeons were the primary physicians. We didn't have anybody do anything. We did all the surgery. We did all the critical care. I mean, it was just like, but that kind of experience is totally, you know, it, it changed how I learned everything. And then I never forgot that. I mean, we always used it. Um, I just think now it's more of an expression of everything that I, I learned, but it's so much better now because now we add functional genomics to it, or we have functional medicine testing, or, you know, we do our own hormone balancing because, you know, uh, I take a, a, a bunch of stick from people around here because they're like, why is Rob doing hormones? I'm like, well, so just so everybody understands, like cancer patients and critically ill patients die if they don't get taken care of properly from a nutritional standpoint. And if their hormones are all out of whack, their cortisol is super high and they don't have enough testosterone, they will not heal. So to, to you know, in order to get someone as lovely as Dr. Horneman in and out of surgery and recover really fast because she's a very busy woman, has a lot going on, I will always make sure her hormones are balanced out because you'll stay swollen longer, you'll have less energy, you'll have more fatigue, um, your results will not be as good. So I always want my patients to have the best results. I mean, 60% of my patients fly in from out of state for a reason. So my program HARP is basically, it's my holistic accelerated recovery program, but it's just basically everything I've done in my career. I make sure that the nutrition, you know, we have a nutritionist on, on staff now, but I make sure from a food sensitivity standpoint, we're controlling inflammation. And then I don't ever want to put anybody through surgery who's having problems with constipation, like a lot of women do, either because of the gut microbiome. So we'll 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 do a gut microbiome test or several. Um, we we just want to make sure that we get you on the right track before you ever have a treatment with us, because your results obviously are my my calling card. But right. you have to feel good in order to get a good result. And people who can't eat and digest their foods or get their nutrition, their nutrients from their foods, they always have a tougher time. They'll stay swollen longer. They'll they'll produce more edema fluid if you want to think of it like that. Right. And you know, we're we have a lymphatic massage therapist in my office full time, and we have a lymphatic uh, uh, massage balancer pro device. So I put everybody in those things because you know, ice compression, elevation, lymphatic massage, good nutrition, balanced hormones knowing your genetics, supplementing them according to that, those people have the best outcomes. Right, right. And and you even, <clears throat> you'll do testing even prior to them yeah. making that final decision to go through the surgery or not. Because what if you found something in testing like balancing hormones? What if you're like, well, maybe your fatigue, you just need some more testosterone right. and then you won't need the explant as much as I want to take your money, right? Like, you might not need it. So let's try this before we move on. It's been very organic because now people are just seeking me out for that program. Yeah. They're not really seeking me necessarily for surgery because it's hard to travel to Austin, but we run our program to care for people who, you know, want to feel better and not have an explant or people who want to feel better after they've had surgery with someone else, which is everybody's prerogative. Obviously, we just, we want everybody to do better. Right. And have as much information to make an informed decision as possible. I think when you understand your genetics, your your hormone levels, your nutritional status, how your gut works, your toxicity levels. I mean, I have so many people with mold. If you live on the coast of this country, I think you have mold. And I won't what operate about, on you. Have you found mold inside the capsule too? Because I had a patient, literally it was, it was myself and, and my health coach, Ron, with our and she's talking about like she has implants and da da da, and and she's like, I have had them in for twenty five years, and we both went, oh, you know, I mean, like if if even if it's not bii, you got some mold growing in that capsule, right? I mean, old saline implants of twenty five years. So we could talk about that. So um, I get asked those questions a lot, and so. After 2016, when I did that case and I, I found that E. coli infection on clea based labs. So always remember that's a taking a swab and swab in a pocket or a, a surface and then growing it in a incubator. Mm -hmm. 
I had a nurse travel from out of state to visit me. Her sister lived in Austin and she had found me and, you know, wanted me to be her surgeon. And she came and I saw her and she was actually an ICU nurse. And I, all I could think of was like all this stuff, this lady has been exposed to her whole career has got to be stuck on her implant somehow. Like she got a cut or, you know, you, you get things by, contamination at the time of surgery by the surgeon or the assistant, or you get hematog, you know, a hematogenous uh, sh uh, showering of that either through uh, having a pneumonia or having a UTI or having a colonoscopy or whatever. There's all sorts of ways to get bacteria into your bloodstream. And I took her implants out and they were the grossest, slimiest things that weren't ruptured. They were completely intact, but they just had biofilm on them. Oh, okay. And okay. I came out to her husband. I said, man, she is going to get better. It's, it's going to be, you know, these are, in, these are infected. I guarantee it. And I did them the old way. I did all the samples and swabs and I sent them off and nothing, nothing came back. And I was like, oh my God, now I look like an idiot because <laughs> I know, I know this is what's going on. Right. But for the audience, that is an inferior technique that's been around a very, very long time. And biofilm is super difficult to both get off of implants and to then declare what the actual offending organism is. Right. <clears throat> and there used to be studies done with this where they would vibrate vascular grafts to get the biofilm to come off because it was so adherent. You couldn't culture it. Then you couldn't treat the patient. You couldn't help them. Mm -hmm. So at that point... I was, I was, ooh, I was probably vice president of the research foundation at that point. So we had been learning about ALCL, which is the anaplastic large cell lymphoma associated most closely with the textured implants. And there was a, a company, Microgen DX in Lubbock, Texas, that they'd used preliminarily for a lot of the, the early work with it. And then MD Anderson started doing their own work and I basically got in touch with that company and I said, look, can I send you my samples and you run them against your panel of bacterial and fungal DNA? Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah. All right. I said, well, I need one price and I'm going to send you all these. And so I did about between 300 and 400 CLIA based samples before I switched to PCR. So PCR for everybody listening all you need is one colony of DNA from a bacteria or fungus or mycobacterium for that matter to give you a positive. So, you know, it's actually there. And so since then I've done over 840 PCR tested samples. And as you would expect, there's a kind of wide variety of bacteria, okay. but the most prominent, the number one bacteria is called cutie bacterium acnes. And it's the, in its highest concentration, it's on our face because it's part of acne, okay. our chest and our shoulders. So is it, is it just the fact that that's on the breast and gets into the nipple and goes down and contaminates a device? Is it the fact that somebody pops a zit and, you know, gives them showers, their bloodstream with you know, this bacteria, right? Is it someone scratching their chest because, you know, it itches and there's, there's a acne, whatever. I don't even, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is what you find. This is reality. Right. And when someone gets on the internet and writes some stupid stuff, I don't really care because I have objective evidence that shows you exactly what is there. When people say they have crazy mold grown in or implants, I'm like, okay. I mean, that sounds awesome. It should be on TMZ, but in reality, <laughs> I only, you know, if you're my patient, whoever's listening, it's all going to be very straightforward for you. I'm not cryptic at all. I do everything by the book every single time. Mm -hmm. I take everything out the same way. I sample it the same way. It's all sent off. You know, our testing is very organized. Our recovery program is excellent. Mm -hmm. Our pre-op medication program is set up for success mm -hmm. to make you have the least amount of nausea. No nerve pain. You know, I use nerve block on everybody. Yep. I mean, like I, I, 
I can't stand variability. Like I want everything to be the best for everybody. So I work really hard to make sure that, you know, the, the, you know, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Well, and I like it too, that you, because I've heard you say this, that you acknowledge that this is an emotional procedure as well as a physical procedure and nurturing their emotions afterwards is just as important for healing as are the hormones, which huge fan of testosterone for healing. We can get into that, but not right away because we have too many rabbit holes to go down. Um, but no, I love that. I love that you you approach it from that. You gotta you gotta heal the woman too afterwards because this is a rough procedure. It's a big choice. It is. It's it's and early on, I didn't offer immediate fat transfers because I didn't kind of know the lay of the land. I didn't know what was completely going on. And actually, a patient got me to do theirs, and she just wouldn't. She wouldn't let it go. She's like, yeah. I cannot have you take these out and not do a fat transfer. Something have some right. So there are answers for women too. Right, to and she knew one of my cancer patients, and she's like, I know you did this for Susie Smith. I know you did this. Yeah. I'm like, well, yeah, I've done over several thousand fat transfers for cancer patients because I used to do over 150 a year, you know, for over a decade, easy for cancer patients. Because obviously when you do a cancer reconstruction, based on the fact that they just had mastectomies, typically bilateral mastectomies, they're not even. Mm -hmm. Nobody's even. Nobody's even to begin with. And nobody's even after that surgery. It's my job to make everybody even. <laughs> so. Right. That's what I do. I mean, thank so, you. Yes. <laughs> right. So fat is the best filler always just for your patients to know. It's the original one and it works. Otherwise, nobody would get a Brazilian butt lift if anybody's been paying attention. Right. No, you don't have one butt cheek bigger than the other. Typically, I mean, it all works. Um, people are best, you know, obviously the breast itself is a very emotional topic for these cases where if I have a petite woman come in with a big implant, and she's small and small framed, obviously those are the people with the most dicey outcomes. So if I can at all, I'm always trying to, you know, anytime you take out a breast implant, it changes the aesthetic and it's not going to be for the better right. in most instances. So I want to, to give back and provide volume, improve shape. You know, if I have to lift and and do that, I can. Um, I've got all sorts of proprietary things we've developed to, to help offset the, you know, what is a very emotional, you know, situation um, for, for the client, you know, first and foremost, but I've tried to get spouses and significant others really more involved so they can appreciate what's going on, you know, from both the physical, but more the emotional, you know, standpoint. And I've, I've, I'm proud to say we've had some very good spouses of late. I've tried to make sure that, you know, as much as possible, they come to all the appointments they can. Sometimes it's obviously not practical for work and things like that. But so they meet me and know what I'm talking about and conveying because I, I can give everybody a lot of information. I, I try to keep it as focused as possible, but um, I have learned over six years a lot about this topic. And I have a lot of grasp of things that I can guarantee most providers have no idea about. Yeah. <laughs> just, that's, yeah. and that's, that's fine. It's just, you know, the emotional stem, the emotional part is harder if the spouse or significant other's not there. Oh. I have a patient advocate who's um, in my office, basically full time for all the, the clients as a resource. And now we have a uh, physician's assistant who's also, um, had an X plant and she's going to run my recovery program. Um, so we're really trying to, and it, it's meaningful, right? They'll always ask a question to those women versus me because they want to know their experience. I, I can't give you that. Exactly. I yeah. I think that helps to have somebody that's gone before you and right. to know like what to expect along the way from the person that's been there and done that. I think that's fantastic. Now, Dr. Rob, I want to throw out the couple of things, the, the cases that we talked about before, or I talked about in the, in the beginning here. So I have had, I would, I would say of my patients, I can think of a solid three that had the explant surgery done, did not get better. Like legit, they're like, 
no, now I got to look at putting them back in. My husband won't let me get them back in because it was expensive surgery, getting them out and this and that. And then one, now I've had, I'm not going to dismiss the grouping over here that I've had of probably five to 10 that I always ask, okay, you had the explanation. How'd you feel? Oh, tremendously changed my world, world of difference. I was felt like I was dying. So we have the people that 100% made a huge difference. We have the three that I know that didn't. And of one of the three, she ended up, but it was a year after the explant, but so crazy. It had to have been connected somehow. Maybe you can clarify. Hives all over her body. I mean, prednisone in and out of the hospital for a year, multiple specialists testing, gut testing, histamine, allergy, did it all these specialists. And finally, she's on now an immunomodulator to keep everything calm. So she doesn't have to be on prednisone the rest of her life. So I'll turn that over to you now. Yeah, I think you, she's somebody who would really benefit from functional genomic testing because she probably has a pathway that's turned on instead of turned down. And okay. that's why, you know, she's experiencing an increased immune response, not a decreased re immune response. So she's... She's a concerning patient. I just took care of a patient with whole body rash, eczema, everything. And I've had several instances where these patients arrive, they have have tried everything under the sun with derms and the derms are kind of at a loss. And then they're like, you know, maybe you should go see someone like, you know, Dr. Rob and see if he can, you know, provide some, you know, guidance about this. Maybe it is a device related issue. Now, in those instances where they have the device, the breast implants in place, and they're having that like eczematous or whole body rash thing, I feel like that's more of a, dare I say, almost like an allergic response. Like when you get a drug rash, it's all over the trunk. And then when you stop the drug, the rash goes away. Mm -hmm. I've taken out implants on table and by the end of the case, many of those rashes are gone. Okay. So that's really more like a, a reaction. And I don't know what's mediating the reaction other than something with the device. Now, not all of those have biofilm either. Mm -hmm. But um, in her, I mean, she's got something probably in her methylation pathway that's completely amped up. And that's why. Um, in the other cases, what, what was the other case? The other two just said they didn't notice any difference. Like they they went through oh, okay. it, and nothing okay. changed in their symptoms. Yeah. Okay. So in those, so those are the reasons why my program exists, right? If you do the work up front, you won't have that because if they're going through the program and they get better, then they're right. just mediating their inflammation and the the medical device, the breast implant, is not the big driver. Mm -hmm. So there are all sorts of drivers, as you know, and your clients know, but the i think what your your salient point is don't jump to the conclusion that it's this right right you know so i took care of patients uh like we have talked about with different forms of cancer and i i had a dual appointment as a plastic surgeon and an orthopedic uh uh surgery appointment where i where i taught and i would take care of sarcoma patients for the audience sarcoma patients very rare cancer it affects fat muscle bone and so people would either get an amputation or a limb salvage procedure. And I was the guy who would help cover the prosthetic used to salvage the limb. So they would take out a portion of your femur or your tibia and they would replace it with a prosthetic. These are huge. I mean, these things are enormous. And the first time I ever saw one, I was like really intimidated. I was like, wow, okay, I better figure out how to cover this up because this is a life over, you know, situation. Like these folks won't survive. They'll get an infection. They could die. Right. Uh, or need an amputation. And in those in those situations, I got to learn, you know, a lot about the orthopedic devices and how they cope with infections and problems. And 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 nobody who operates and uses a device is immune from anything. Doesn't matter what type of device it is. Deep brain stimulators from neurosurgeons I took care of, defibrillators from cardiac people. Mm -hmm. Uh infected sternums from cardiac surgeons um 
with their plates and all their crazy junk, um, sternal wires, all, all, all sorts of crazy stuff I've taken care of, infected, you know, tibial prosthesis or femurs or hips or knees or whatever. Yeah. Like nobody's immune to this stuff. Right. But I can tell you now, spending all this time looking at everybody's genetics, you can definitely figure out who's more susceptible to it. So in the four pathways, if you're missing or have problems in all four of them, like everybody asks me, Rob, can you, is there a test? Do you have a test for this? Can you, can you tell if someone has breast implant illness? I'm like, well, no, but I can tell you who's more susceptible to develop it. I, yeah. I can, I can tell you that, you know, through genetics, I think that's my best like lens to look through and see like based on their immune pathway function who's more susceptible to this and then i think that's basically the take-home message that i can share with you and your audience is like you can't outrun your genetics right right you didn't pick your parents but they definitely <laughs> gave you your genetics yeah so the more you learn about that the better off you'll be and you know maybe that's at the end game what all of this work is is accomplished is that i feel better like about that as an answer now i've always been really reluctant i don't i don't like to i don't like to go out there if i can't support what i'm saying with sure. you know data I, I don't i don't feel like that's something we should ever do for you know patients they put a lot of faith in us to give them the best you know answers and i feel like i've i've answered a lot of the questions that i i started with in 2016 after that case so yeah well, no, we're, we're happy you're doing what you're doing. Before I let you go, though, we have to talk about the revision issues mm -hmm. because we've talked about, you know, some symptoms that people can have, how to check, you know, even just coming to you for that kind of rundown of their genetics, genomics to see if it, maybe they are susceptible to this. But now we have revisions. Now, for when you said that, here's, here's my mind peaking because I had... I went from under to over, under the muscle to over the muscle, changed from saline to silicone. Once we figured out silicone's not so bad and it has a much better shape and then mm -hmm. changed, actually went down in size. So I've had four now. So does that make me more prone to breast cancer or to even BII, but both answer both of those or are you yeah. talking total revisions? No, I, I think what I look at it is because I, I see so much biofilm, which for the audience, once again, it's just, is it a contaminant of bacteria or fungus? Predominantly it's bacteria. So I didn't say it before, but I've only had four instances of fungus out of 1100 samples, 1100 explants that I've done. And so it's predominantly what I said, it's cutie bacterium acnes, and that's from our skin of our face, neck, chest, shoulders. In revisions, because it's entering the space again, and I always will say the same thing, it's always best to be first. Uh, yeah. Because that's the best time to have the best result, right? The first time is the best time. If it's done properly, hand and glove fit, you know, that's, that's how I always was taught. And that's how I always think about it. Mm -hmm. Each time you go back, there's scarring the blood flow is not as good as the time before um there's aging there may have been pregnancy there may have been weight loss weight gain um there's just a lot of factors and every time you open a surgical space where there's a breast implant a hip implant a knee implant you have the opportunity to in introduce bacteria into that environment so i always worry about people becoming super symptomatic after they had an exchange, after they had some repair or revision. Um, because I did so much of that work, I know what the issues are, but once again, it was a different type of work I did and it was all more uh, hospital mediated with very specific protocols in place for you know, what we were doing, what techniques we were using, how, like everything was always for me like, very rote in, and if this was your you know mom's breast implant for breast cancer or this was your dad's knee implant for a knee cancer it, it was always like that kind of pressure i put to each 
case. And I always tell everybody, like, you know, it's easier to be a professional athlete. They only play the Super Bowl once a year. Yeah, that's true. Every time I operated on a woman for breast cancer, that was the Super Bowl. That was Super Bowl. Yeah. So 95% of the time I was successful in the Super Bowl. Yeah, that's not, that's not, those are some good stats right there. I want you on my fantasy football team. So <laughs> but that's, that's, I mean, those are the things that, you, you know, everybody wants to come see you for their thyroid. You, you want to see the best person to take care of you for that, for that problem. And that's the yeah. pressure we put on ourselves and our programs when we, we did those. So, I mean, it's, it's no different now. I just feel like when I hear those things, my ears perk up. If someone tells me like they have, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite questions to ask people is um, when you get in the car with your significant other or your kids, regardless of what decibel the stereo is on, do you turn it down? Do you turn down the car radio every single time you get in it? And a hundred percent, they're like, oh yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. So you have sound sensitivity. Oh. And I'm like, do you, do you have like light sensitivity as well? Does light bother you? Oh yeah. A lady told me she had to wear headphones to do the dishes in her sink. Oh, okay. That is sound sensitivity. Dang. All right. And then if they have headache and it's kind of obvious, like who's got mold, right? Mm -hmm. They're anxious. They can be, you know, a little bit angry. <laughs> right. But then sometimes I'll go to, well, you don't have enough progesterone too. So <laughs> I don't know. But in Texas, I think you all, everybody has mold until everybody's got mold in Texas. Yeah, that's yes. true. Yes. So I just, I like answer, I asked the question. I was like, where were you living? I'm I'm like the, like the home reno detective. I mean, did you renovate your house when you were living in it or did mm -hmm. you move to a different one? And there's so many old homes in Austin and yep. old like condo buildings and apartment buildings. Like the kids who go to uh, school here, they live in some really old places. And the moms will tell me, oh, you know, I went and visited my kid and there's mold in the, in the vent. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh Lord, you yeah, know, and, and people who don't, you know, they're, if their glutathione metabolism is poor, you know, what's going to happen. Right. They're going to have a chronic mold exposure because they yeah. can't kick it out of their liver. And, you know, it becomes all like when you just listen to the patterns, it's everything you went through in school. Like they're just different now. Now they're genomic patterns instead of the patterns we were taught about specific disease processes because nobody nobody taught you about toxic mold exposures. I mean, no, no, I need that only happened to immunosuppressed people, right? Yeah. Exactly. Now this has been great, and then see that's all just a, another example of how deep into each individual patient you go really checking all of the boxes. And I mean, all of the boxes, if we could clone you and then put you into endocrinology, <laughs> some rheumatology, <laughs> that would be amazing. I, I actually had an OB send a patient to me. Hey, why not? I mean, listen, you do it all. What the hell? So, uh, <laughs> and you're going to do it better than the run of the mill conventional OB. I'm going to tell you that. Yeah, they, they got a lot. I mean, that's your primary care provider. And that's for a lot of women. That's, you know, it's, they just, we all have to do better, basically. You just got to do better. Exactly. So Dr. Rob, we will have obviously all of your contact information everywhere. In right. The description, the show notes, but are you taking new patients right now? Yes. I am. Okay. So you can contact us a couple ways. I have two sites, uh, my breast implant illness expert.com site and my dr robert whitfield.com site. And um, those are the two fundamental ways. You can follow us on social, Dr. Robert Whitfield um, on Instagram and TikTok. Um, and my show, I uh, hope to have you on soon. Uh, Holistic Plus Scientific is my podcast. Awesome. We'll put all the links in so people will be able to easily find you. But Dr. Rob, thank you so much for your time today. I greatly appreciate it. This was the message that I wanted to give my listeners. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.